Hello and welcome, independent researchers, skeptics, and all of humankind, the Shadow Citizen. Welcome to episode 4. This week's guest is Sean Stone. You are listening to a live broadcast on mixlr.com slash forward shadow citizen. And from there you can chat with us also. We're also simulcast and rebroadcast at radioconfluence.com. And from there you can take us with you on TuneIn or Xeno Live. For our upcoming guest and for our archives, please go to shadowcitizen.online. My name is Rob O'Sell, and my co-host is... Rachel L. McIntosh, and I am so thrilled once again to be here. Um, We have Sean Stone with us today. He is the son of the famous film director Oliver Stone, but he is famous in his own right. He's been doing things like Watching the Hawks, which is on RT, and Buzzsaw, which a lot of our listeners probably have watched. It's on uh, Gaia, the Gaia Network. Um, But the big deal is that he just finished this documentary called A Century of War, and it gives a historical perspective of the U.S.'s shift in this post-industrial society, and it offers up strategies to reinvigorate the U.S. infrastructure. Um, He's got this huge bio. I mean, it's huge, and it's awesome. He's author of uh, Greystone Park and a documentary called Fight Against Time, Oliver Stone's Alexander. And he's got lots of little short documentaries. And we're just thrilled to have you here. We're so happy to have you here. Sean, how you doing? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, no, yeah. the, uh, I don't know where the author, no, Graystone Park is a feature film, and I was author of a book called New World Order. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah sorry, I, I didn't mention the, that. Yeah, they that's... They put out that was a little bit, uh, I know the Russians uh, don't understand English sometimes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I scooped that off of the... Um, the RT site, so I apologize, yeah. but the um, <laughs> New World Order book. So tell us about that. Uh, the New World Order book? Mm-hmm. Um, that was derived from my thesis when I was at college, doing my um, thesis in American history, and I wanted to focus on this character named William Yandel Elliott, who was uh, Henry Kissinger's mentor while at Harvard. He Elliott also trained and taught many people, including Kennedy, but his main, uh, I would say, disciples were people like um, uh, McGeorge and William Bundy, um, Sam, uh, Sam Huntington, Clash of Civilizations fame, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski was one of his student colleagues. So uh, Iliad had a very important influence, obviously, on uh, shapers of American government and foreign policy. So I was curious to know Eliot's own pedigree and in discovering the fact that he'd really been trained by what Carol Quigley had called the roundtable groups, basically the British imperialists of the early 20th century that wanted to preserve British imperialism under a new guise, um, it becomes clear that the New World Order concept was basically uh, utilizing the Anglo-American empire as a, as a content or establishment, as a base. Uh, the Anglo-American empire is the context by which you could expand your global influence and dissolve nation states uh, through things like um, international laws, uh, international trade agreements, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. these IMF, World Bank system, you name it, the uh, militarism, the point is to always um, to, to sap the idea of uh, the West, what used to be the, na- the nation states were predicated in the Westphalian world, right, post um, uh, the Peace of Westphalia after the Thirty Years' War. The idea of national sovereignty was very important, and then these guys, under their imperial, imperial logic, wanted to basically get rid of this notion of sovereignty so that they could preserve the empire of, you know, particularly in places in Africa, for example, the Middle East, um, Asia as much as possible, although China constantly was a, was a problem, and Russia was also a problem in Central, uh, in Central Asia slash Eurasia. So um, that's been the eternal conflict for the British, have been the Russians and the Chinese to some extent, but mostly the Russians. Uh-huh. So in this book, The New World Order, A Strategy of Imperialism, people will see this all laid out for them. Yes or no? They'll see it. I mean, they can read it. It's a scholastic. It's very right, scholastic. and then that's pretty scholastic. But then, it's go ahead, good. I'm sorry. It's, 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 you know, it's certainly very, you know, cited and, do- and documented. So I would say 
it's not an easy read. It's mm-hmm. certainly um, you know, it's uh, one for the home library, let's say, right? Huh? One for the home library. Oh, for the home library. I mean, again, if people are interested in the New World Order as a concept, if they understand conspiracy theory and the nature of how conspiracies work, I think mm-hmm. this is a good study in that because it shows you that conspiracies are ideas that get planted and live on through their disciples who then transmit it, like people like Eliot. And Eliot was very much at the center of this nexus of uh, education because he was a professor at Harvard for 40 years. Mm-hmm. Um, he was advising presidents. So there's the government connection, and then there's the finance connection because he was close to the Rockefeller Fund and the Rockefeller Brothers. He may have helped conduct Kissinger there because Kissinger was hired by the Rockefeller Brothers, right, to write his first um, mm-hmm. his first works, um, and he became a Rockefeller man at that point. So it's important to understand how conspiracy functions, uh, and you can't exclude the intellectual apparatus from that, the intelligence, right. yeah, this education system that's always been part of the the intelligence function. In fact, Elliot himself was a CIA agent. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, on, now on your newest documentary, you had Naomi Prin- or Nomi Prince in there, excuse me, and uh, she had a book called "All the President's Bankers," uh, you know, which is you know, an awesome book on, on on this subject. But so it, it's always the money powers, and so at one time the the sun never s- set on the British Empire, and then what? It was after the Brenton Woods Agreement that uh, the United States uh, became the world or the the US dollar became the world reserve currency and so now we've kind of the British Empire has now become this Anglo-American empire uh, and you know that it's really covered well in your your latest documentary that was like a four part that was aired on uh, RT, RT right? yeah yeah yes yeah it aired on RT and it was in a way I would say New World Order is the backstory it's kind of the, the deeper history um, mm-hmm. of how America got co-opted into this empire. And Century of War is how this empire played out because we think that America, you know, we think of America as the greatest country in the world and the richest country and all this, but then you look at the actual function of what wealth means and it doesn't mean the same thing anymore. There was a time when wealth connoted the sort of a standard of a higher standard of a rising standard of living, let's say. The idea was that you know, the poor and the middle class were, were rising in, ter- in, their, in their status. And then you look at the actual consequence of American wealth, and it's become more and more predicated in, in banking, right, banking and, and debt. So okay. people basically don't own as much. They're, they, ha- they have, you know, they have mortgages, they have loans, um, they have debts they have to pay off. And so we've replaced the idea of actually owning things and having wealth that are in our own possession um, and paid off now with like a credit card wealth that's taken yes. over. Yes, I, I was, just at, I was uh, just at the grocery store and I was walking through the grocery store parking lot and I was looking at all the brand new cars in the parking lot and mm-hmm. I was thinking to myself, We're, this is a, like a culture of debt. All these people have brand new cars, Range Rovers, everything. I'm like, where are these people getting this money? They're borrowing this money and this is how people are living. It's not yeah. like there's anything wrong with that. I mean, I don't know they're balancing their lives around it, but this is what America has come to. There's certainly certainly nothing wrong with, I would say, having wealth from, uh, you know, having having wealth from uh, buying, you know, being able to afford new cars and things like this. Yeah, no, but no. what it boils down to is that we've been able to afford this li- this lifestyle because, as you say, the U.S. has become the reserve currency. Uh, of the planet, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it wasn't just Bretton Woods, it was deeper. It was actually the oil deals of the of 73. Uh, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the uh, oil deals of 73 were the key because that's when <laughs> America shifted from 71, we shifted out of Bretton Woods, right? And right. basically, no longer were we backing the dollar with gold. It was actually right. the dollar was the was the reserve currency, but really gold was backing the entire system up. Mm-hmm. Well, when Nixon pulls the plug on the gold, um, we have to find something else to back the dollar unofficially, and that became oil. So the idea was the petrodollar was that every country in the world that needs oil lives on oil has to acquire dollars. They have to trade for dollars uh, to buy. In order to buy their right. uh, the uh, the oil, 
So you know, you know imagine that's how how much how much uh, how do you say how much that strengthened the U.S. dollar globally and made sure that it's the reserve currency and stays that way. And so and again you know in the in the process the banks expanded their power mm -hmm. through this arrangement with with the oil co oil companies because they were recycling their their wealth that was in you know people were buying oil from Saudi Arabia for example Saudi Arabia would turn around and invest in you know U.S. real estate or weapons or banks. And it all recycled back in some form. I, I want to back so, up just a little bit here because you, might, you know, you mentioned credit card debt, and you know, I think in your your documentary there, it mentioned that how uh, student loan debt has now surpassed credit card debt. And I remember during the the campaign, you know, that Trump at one time uh, mentioned that, well, student loan debt is the only thing the, the the federal government's making money on right now, which just kind of blew my mind. Hmm. Uh, sure. That, I mean, that would make sense. Um, yeah, certainly uh, the federal loan program, right? Right. Because a lot of these these schools are, fed, um, I don't know, federally funded or or have some kind of uh, federal support. Well, yeah, the student loan program, and, and and people are graduating, and they you know they have you know upward of eighty thousand dollars in debt. So that really kind of shrimps you know the credit card debt of most households. Although some households do manage to run up that much you know so uh, it's a vicious circle it's hard to get out of right right and you have to imagine that the reason that they're expanding this debt bubble right I mean imagine it was like in the, in the 2000s the debt bubble was around the housing right so the prime is and people always said oh it's because they actually want you to have a house they want you to have an education no they don't they don't mm -hmm. they need <laughs> they need the this this debt in a sense um, to put to I mean, again, like the financial architecture itself is so elaborate. I'm not an expert on it, but the nature of derivatives and what has been um, created as, as a whole post Glass Steagall. Mm -hmm. derivatives, derivatives were there pre Glass Steagall, but the idea of post Glass Steagall was that the banks had, were able to consolidate so that they could access the depositors' wealth. They could actually start to access people's money that would just be put into what used to be um, a non, you know, the investment banks were supposed to be separate from the merchant and commercial banks. But that all got merged together. And then you also merged the insurance companies into it. So it became this huge scheme of, you know, these, these, this ma the massive, you know, Citibank traveler deal, right? Where it's like insurance and, and, and investment banking and commercial banking all merging together to create a debate that can now make these massive investments in derivatives and things like that. Well, derivatives are a lot of, there's a lot of speculation involved, there's a lot of futures, uh, futures involved. People are saying there's quadrillions of dollars of derivatives floating around the world, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how do you ultimately back that up, you know, in terms of losses and whatnot? Well, you have to keep accessing or feeding on, you know, even without real money, you can still feed on people's debts. The expectation right. to pay at least some amount over the course of a fixed period of time into the future indefinitely. <laughs> so that's where we are. We we're basically in a place of virtual money but the virtual money is really mainly debt and not actual mm -hmm. ownership not actual you know wealth and so the documentary is highlighting the fact that we've come to the place of virtual power and virtual wealth but we look at the physical infrastructure and it's not going it's into not this, this virtual wealth is not being employed to show an actual rise in standards of living for the lower class you have the middle class has actually been shrinking well, I, I think I that's was, one of the areas yeah. that uh, Catherine Austin Fitz kind of oh, covered. Good, she's I'm glad talk. you brought her up because she's great. And the thing she said about the drug dealing, go for it, Rob. Well, yeah, and plus she's going to be one of our guests here in the future, so we're really stoked about that. But, yeah, she said uh, that, you know, you have the drug dealer down on the corner that's making 100000 and then he goes, you know, and then there's these drug dealers are spending their money at the – you know, whatever fast food store, you know, whether it's Starbucks or whatever, and then, you know, there's a, and enough of the money is going in there that, you know, they, that that store has a PE ratio of, you know, 33 to one or whatever. And so all of this stuff is being monetized and it's all, yeah, it's this whole derivative thing that, uh, that 100,000 on the street can be millions of dollars, you know, that's being traded on Wall Street. So it's- Yeah, and even worse is that the people that are selling the drugs they don't have to be educated. They don't have to know any skill. They're like, it's easy. It's easy labor to get your product to your customer, and you're right. making tons was, of money. 
Yeah, I mean, that was always, I believe, the strategy of the drug war. I believe that's why CIA and related intelligence agencies were so involved in the trafficking of narcotics. Um, mm-hmm. People, you know, people like the Bush family, uh, Bush mm-hmm. Sr. in particular, um, seems to have been uh, notoriously overseeing the drug traffic. And it goes back to the 19th century. There's a great book called Dope Inc. that talks about it. The fact was the opium wars, right? This this was the the pure the purest best model of free trade that the British and their sycophants in the, in the Eastern establishment could come up with. You know, those being the Forbes families and um, you know the various like Bundys, Lowells, you know the, the rich families of the East. A lot of those families were involved in trade, and the trade was oftentimes um, opium and slave trading. Right, right. And so what you would do is you trade, you know, and after let's say the Slavery was banned, let's say, in what 1830s, I believe, or so, for tra- for trafficking purposes, trade purposes. But from, you would still be shipping cotton that was made by slaves in the South to England, where mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. they would the textile industry would would uh, weave it into spool it, you know, into clothing, and then they would ship that to India, where they had a colony and they banished they banned the Indians from making their own textiles. But again, it was the free trade of the English, so <laughs> free trade often monopoly capitalism. Right. So the point is, they sell then the um, the clothing to the Indians, who have to pay for it using opium from Afghanistan, mm-hmm. and then the opium is then shipped to China, where you dump it on the Chinese who are trying to block you. But you say no, no, free trade, free trade. We're gonna dump it on you, and you dump opium, and you get silver in exchange, and that was a British free trade model. So yeah. what did we get as a result? I mean, you got a tremendous amount of opium addicts in China. Um, not to say that opium is always bad. Personally, I don't have anything against it. I think it's, you know, it's fine in moderation. But, you know, you can get opium addicts, especially when the economy is bad. People are unemployed. And yeah. so that's what exactly what happened in the U.S. post-World War II. And I would say particularly from the 60s and 70s forward, when you had this, um, I would say, you know, orientation that could have been, let's invest in America. Let's make, let's turn the, tanks into rail, new rail systems you know let's um let's work on you know new uh, new pa- new power sources uh you know let's focus on our waterways and bridges and things like this no and especially the south the south was never industrialized <laughs> no let's right. not do that let's focus on the war machine so right, we have right. a population that then gets unemployed and is particular like it basically is in- increasingly desperate from the 60s 70s and then particularly it starts getting bad and really at the 80s 90s forward so I think yeah. that's when you have to um, you have to dump the drugs into the community to basically a give them some kind of economy, but also to placate them, as Aldous Huxley had talked about. You know, you have to keep the slaves happy. Yep, exactly. I went to um, just the last week. The high school right around the corner from me had an an evening presentation in their auditorium, and it's called it was on a movie called Chasing the Dragon, and mm-hmm. the Rhode Island State Attorney General was there, and it was presented by the AG's office and all sorts of organizations about opioid addiction. And I was mm-hmm. su- so totally surprised to learn that most people in the United States are not, they're not doing, they're doing heroin, but they got there because they were addicted to opioids. Mm-hmm. And that more people are dying from opioids in the United States than car accidents or guns right yeah, now. Yeah. Oh yeah, and, like four thousand a year. Yeah, and then they told us that in Rhode Island, I'm, it's a little little state that I live in, that the amount of people that died from overdose, five times as many people were brought back to life by the po- police or by the EMTs with you know those special shots they give people, and they said that the increase has just gone up so high so fast from 2012. They can't believe it, and they're really scared. And then they had people um, whose family members had died, you know, the the typical thing, the scared straight sort of stuff. But I was literally astounded. The worst part is not so much the heroin, it's the fentanyl that's being cut into it, which is another opioid. And then this is thing called car fentanyl, which is basically elephant tranquilizer. Then that is literally what's killing people. When people put the needle into them, they don't even have to pull the trigger all the way. They're already going to die. Mm-hmm. And it freaked me right out. And it made me think because it made me think of the opium wars 
because this is like a model. And I told my kids about it. I said, I'm going to this thing. And, I, and my kids are in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. And I had homeschooled them up until this year. And so they had learned about the Opium Wars. And they were interested in the movie because of the Opium Wars. And um, so I asked for the, the copy of it to show to my kids. It really freaked me out by how many people are just dying because of, you know, shooting themselves up. Right. And it is, it's a, it's because I think, I don't know what it is, but the economy, whenever the economy gets like this, it's, it's when well, it starts. Yes. Um, I'll tell you what it is. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a consequence of the invasion in Afghanistan. Yeah. That was really what it was. Afghanistan, as I said, was going back to the opium wars. It was the, it was a source of the poppies that created the opium. And, mm -hmm. um, and you, you know, you knew you were going to get a consequence. Uh, revival of various addictions, you know, particularly heroin and whatnot, because of that invasion. Because there, you know, that's where most of the um, um, the poppies are grown. I mean, there's a huge, there's a huge poppy crop, so it ex exploded the um, the opioid, the opi I guess the uh, growth of and creation of opioids and you know, and heroin in particular. All that gets trapped out of Afghanistan. So it's not only huge money for the financial machine, because again, all you know, all the money ultimately recycles back the shadow, the shadow economy what's it called you know the, the shadow banking ultimately gets back into um you know the wall street city of london and major bank financial centers switzerland as well mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, major hubs of this kind of a interesting tie-in here you know I, just this past year i i found out that the the rockefellers are pretty much out of oil now and i believe they've gone into uh you know healthcare almost exclusively so they're back to their snake oil salesmen uh, I was telling mm -hmm. Rachel before we uh, added you to the call, I, I just started a cab driving job here trying to make ends meet, but I was amazed that most of my fares, you know, at least half of them, are uh, their credits that are billed to the county, and they're from people that live in, in, in you know, government housing, and they're going back and forth to the clinic, you know, whether it's for, you know, transfusions or blood tests or, or whatever, but they, these are all my fares that they're... So it's, you know, the government it has these people that have now the system has, you know, used them up and chewed them out. And so now they're uh, they're using them again by they're just the subjects that are keeping the the health industry alive, because that's probably the healthiest industry we have, especially now with the baby boomers going into it. But uh, I, it just kind of really struck me that, wow, you know, where are all the regular fares? So. I don't know if you've heard. Yeah, that's a nice addition. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And so you're Not saying cool, but <laughs> you're saying these people are going in for for um, you said medical purposes, medical reason. Uh, yeah, all my you know all my half of my fares have been in between uh, just you know government housing, county housing, and then uh, you know to either the clinic or the hospital. You know, and at the hospital, I mean, I was surprised that you know I, I've only driven cab two days and I had three people that were going in t for transfusions you know I'm kind of going, what you know I thought transfusions were relatively rare but uh, uh, and then other people just going out for tests and but all of these people are you know like I say they're kind of uh, they're in government housing and uh, so they're they're feeding the medical uh, industrial complex now and like I say the Rockefellers kind of got out of oil because the industry is dying uh, and now they're, I think they've moved in pretty much into medical. So, uh, uh, you know. Sure. And, they, and we know how powerful the medical business is. I mean, frankly, big, you know, I, um, big pharmaceuticals, um, it was told to me that uh, Ailes, Roger Ailes, had, had, had talked privately with someone I know about um, Vax. Remember the documentary about yes. the dangers of the MMR vaccine? Yeah. And again, it's not, look. I'm not someone who's going to say every vaccine is is deadly. I I certainly am you know not taking the flu shot. That's for sure. But <laughs> far there was um, there you know there was indication that if you if you took measles, mumps, or rubella separately, it was not showing the kind of reaction that when they were put together it was having. The MMR vaccine had some very devastating results on people. Thank you, Here, thank you, thank you. That is true. Parents, That's you know, true. the document was good. It showed parents reacting to their kids saying, look. I took my kid in, and a day later, he, you know, my my son or my daughter is not the same. So, you know, what are you going to say? The parent was lying. I mean, it's this is tragic stuff. And so, 
Yeah. So when, I w- when I went to college, when I was at that age to go to college, they told everybody you had to go and have your shots up, get your updated shots. So I was still in high school. I got an MMR. And then when we got to college, there was a measles outbreak on campus. So we were on a quarantine. We couldn't go in or out. And they came through and they gave us the MMR again. We got not just a regular measles shot. We got the MMR again. And within the year, I started showing symptoms for MS. And I have MS. And honestly, I swear to God, it's because I think I had the MMR twice within a year. Yeah. Well, I, I, have an, I have another friend who had a shot like that exactly on campus. Um, I believe it was uh, one of those anti, um, I don't think it was hepatitis. I think it was like anti, uh, what is it, HPV things? They oh, now my gosh. Yeah, those are scary. Stupid. And, and uh, she's, she's had serious, serious health issues as a result ever since. Um, so I know what you're saying. But as far as what Ailes was talking about was that, you know, he had confided that, yes, the thing was back on backs in the relation to autism with MMR in particular concerned him. Um, apparently, he had some personal reasons for it, but he said, "Look, I can't put this on Fox because most of our sixty percent, seventy percent of our revenue from advertising is coming from big pharma." Right. Yeah. So you know they're completely gagged on the media front, right? Mm-hmm. So that's what they're constantly selling you. It's like they're constantly selling you. It's it's a daze. If you watch commercials, I think the Super Bowl is enlight- enlightens us to what's really why our country is so weird like that. And <laughs> on one hand, you know, it's like one commercial shows we're all together in peace. I remember what, from exactly that image of everyone's, you know, united and connected, and we're all, you know all our faces are similar. We're all human. It went right from that to a tank commercial, blasting you know blasting houses, saying you know come play a war game. It was really uh-huh. insane, like juxtaposition. Yeah. It's the same thing when they do with commercials. They show you. You know, the take this for you know to get an erection, <laughs> and then yep. the next thing you know, it's like now you can't sleep at night and you're getting sn- you know getting sick or something. Here, take this to fall asleep. I mean, it's really amazing if you watch how commercials are leading uh-huh. you along. Or like here, eat this burger and then take this for heart pain. The next commercial, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah you take your Lipitor. It will help you eat that burger, right? Oh my gosh, yeah. America's kind of we are a funny crowd. We got. Well, and, and we that's got, and that's the new model, the new health model. It's like they're saying for diabetics too. Well, don't worry about how much sugar you eat now. Just take more insulin. So yeah, they just uh, everything is just regulated through the drugs and not through you know your healthy lifestyle because we don't really care about healthy lifestyles. You know, we don't care about eating good food. Uh, we could spend all sorts of time, <laughs> you know, on on the GMOs or you know. I, I, half the people I picked up in the cab too all had bad, bad coughs, and I don't think they're all smokers. But uh, you know, I kind of wonder. You see the lines in the skies, and you go, "Oh my gosh, is it really getting well, that I'll, bad?" I mean, I just want to point out really quickly Aldous Huxley's quote because I was saying he's, you know, Brave New World predicted it. He said, mm-hmm. "Huxley said this: there will be in the next generation or so a pharmacological method of making people love their servitude and producing dictatorship without tears, so so to speak, producing a kind of painless concentration camp." for entire societies, so that people will, in fact, have their liberties taken away from them, but will rather enjoy it, because they'll be distracted from any desire to rebel by propaganda or brainwashing, Mm -hmm. or brainwashing Mm -hmm. enhanced by pharmacological methods. And this seems to be the final revolution. And I, I almost wonder too, because you you know you hear people talk about the meds that they're on and how much yeah. it would cost, you know that these things you know how expensive they are. But because they're on, you know, medical assistance, assistance, the government is picking up the check. So it's almost like uh, saying, well, the government loves me because they're willing to shell out this kind of money to keep me, you know, in this drug that's keeping me alive. It's it's sort of a, yeah, love your servitude uh, through that type of method. Well, it too. starts off. It starts off. Sm- but for the youngsters, too, it was, what is it, one in five U.S. young males are on Adderall, which mm. is an amphetamine. One in five. That's crazy talk. There's a really good documentary on that. Um, uh, well, that that's one of the issues brought up in um, letters from Generation Rx, Generation Prescription. Um, oh, there sucks. was the director who did, he did a movie a documentary called Generation Prescription. And that was about 10 years ago now. And then Letters from Generation Prescription should be coming out this year. He's working on it, getting it out. But it really, really poignant stories, precisely what you're saying. The problem is kids are on Adderall. Well, God knows why. I mean, I still don't understand why, how ADD just cropped up out of nowhere, unless, unless it's some kind of consequence of 
uh, excessive brain stimulation from television and computer gaming at an early age. Uh, if, you know, if that's still, you know, if that is causing it, I could understand. But um, in terms of trying to treat it with, you know, Adderall and things like this, a you you have to up the dosage as they go because mm-hmm. they tend to right they tend to uh, adapt and lose uh, it loses the impact and it loses its uh, ability to, to calm the child so you up the dosage and ultimately you're damaging a lot of organs and things in the process um, I really would advocate people to go back to treating their kids with like hey don't give your kid an iPad at two years old don't give you know don't let them engage with too much television you know limit it to a couple hours but give them as much Playtime, running out with their friends, going out, doing sports activities, you know, creative space, being bored. That's the most important thing for a kid, frankly. I, I hated it, but I, it helped me so much as a child um, with the idea of, you know, I would go to places like India with my dad at 10 years old, and you'd be bored as, you know, you can imagine <laughs> the most boring place in some ways, stimulating, but also very boring. Um, but you learn a lot and you, you know, you absorb things when you're bored and you start to create your own stories or fantasies or, you know, you write or play music. I mean, we've got to remember that, that we are humans as are, as humans are creators. So rather than always being stimulated and expecting someone else to stimulate us and shut down our creative capacity, we have to give ourselves the space to actually invent and create for ourselves. That's one of That is wonderful. One of the things that uh, Michael Rivera always says, you know, they call it ADD now. In my day, you know, they used to call it the teachers boring the shit out of me. So I'm you know, <laughs> fidgeting in my desk. And and that's true. I mean, you know, look at uh, how, how they've done away with, you know, Phi Ed, too, or just going out in the playground and having all the swings and, uh, you know, and or playing. You can't play dodgeball anymore because it you know burns off too much energy and we might not be able to push the drugs on you. It's uh, it is pretty crazy. So. Uh, this is pretty interesting. Here we are. We're we're a boomer, a Gen Xer, a millennial, <laughs> and we're talking o- over uh, the internet here. So I we've actually got uh, someone in the room here who's from London and someone from uh, Australia and then all over the United States. So isn't this cool? <laughs> I, I love yeah, it. Yeah, this is pretty neat that we're having this conversation like this. And I'm do so happy guys, you're here, Sean. This is awesome. Those, this is really cool. Do our mystery guests participate? Do they ask questions or talk or, or are they just... Are they just ghosts? Uh, they're in the room here, and uh, let's see. I could try to come up with some questions. Uh, do you want me to do the tie color report while you're getting that out of them? Oh uh, yeah. The Why don't you? Uh, yeah, well, well, I'll start the music here for the tie color report, and then uh, we'll have Rachel do that. And Sean, pay attention because I'm a blue collar handyman uh, that's kind of colorblind, so this is kind of out of my league. <laughs> <laughs> Shadow Citizen presents the Necktie Color Report. And now for this week's interpretation of the subliminal messaging in Necktie Color is shown in this week's photos distributed by the mainstream media. Okay, and that's you, Rachel. Take it away. All right, right on. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the Shadow Citizen Tie Color Report. This is my weekly rundown of the current issues and how they were presented to the public via the powerful messaging system of men's neckties. If you've been with us for the past couple of weeks, you've hopefully come to understand that the color of someone's, like the President of the United States, necktie is very important. Not only in a, hey, that looks nice type of way, but on a psychological level, meaning how it makes your emotions move, and a physiological level, meaning how it affects your entire body. You've heard me talk about how this dash of color on a man's necktie acts as a signifier of what the content of his message is trying to convey. Working a defense contractor and having to select neckties for people before they went on air forced me to research this area of communication. Having your spokesperson, sometimes disguised as a congressman, show up in front of millions of people, it was imperative that I research what colors meant in specific contexts. For instance, this past week, I witnessed an onslaught of contentious media coverage and social media slap fights regarding a travel slash Muslim ban. While President Trump did not show up in many live shots regarding this ongoing issue, the pundits were all over the place and in everyone's face. Sure, there was an expected ample sampling of purple and blue and red ties, but it was while I was enjoying sushi at a sushi bar outfitted with large plasma screen TVs broadcasting CNN, 
when I saw via the little scrolling news bar at the bottom that a federal judge had proclaimed that the president's 90-day travel ban was unconstitutional. Um, upon discovering that message on the screen, two boomer-aged couples did high fives, and immediately the pundits came rolling out on the screen. Although the attire of the pundits is not held to the same levels of scrutiny as someone like the president, I did notice, starting that very single night, a shift in the ties showing up in the media. They were all reminiscent of the 1970s, and I'm not even kidding. The tones were of the avocado fall palette, and amazingly, lots of brown. And I had to look that one up. I've never placed brown ties on the news. So I whipped out my handy dandy Worcester color test and saw that when brown is moved to the front and center, it brings about feelings of discomfort. The situation is one of insecurity, an atmosphere of conflict where one is unable to cope physical unease and a greater need for the situation to be ameliorated. In other words, the situation needs to be fixed. Dr. Lusher states in his book that the preference for Brown was very apparent in survivors of World War II. It was not that their bodies were physically sensitive, but there was no place where they could feel secure. He says that Brown indicates the importance of roots of home, to be in the company of one's own kind. It literally says that, in the company of one's own kind. Amazing. And these pundits kept rolling out on CNN. I'm thinking the presence of horizontal striped brown ties has more to do with latching on to the boomers and the folks that were at the height of their sexual energy during the 1970s. Interestingly, the horizontal stripes are now running opposite than they were in the 70s, when the stripes usually ran up to the right shoulder. Anyhow, I noticed brown ties on lots of people this week, everyone from Sheldon Whitehouse, the Rhode Island Democratic Senate senator, during the filibuster against the nominee for Trump's Secretary of Education, to the investment people on MSNBC, to Trump's trilateral counsel pick for National Security Council. Anyway, I thought that was an interesting shift, but don't worry, I'll keep you posted on more tie developments next week. And that's my tie color report for this week. Any questions there, John? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's it's cool to break it down. Um, I've been fascinated by the red and the blue. Yeah. <laughs> the focus, obviously, of um, the president and uh, and his advisor, and then frankly, the Patriots on the Super Bowl, and they're about as red as blue, red and blue as it gets. I thought mm -hmm. that was kind of a, a jip. I wondered about that when the when the Patriots came back and won. I said, wait, well. Trump did keep saying Patriots in his opening day inauguration speech, if you recall. That's right. That's I, right. I'm going to play the co conspiracy uh, card here. Uh, did you happen to see Dick Gregory uh, came out, and it was during the primaries, but uh, they asked him, you know, uh, why Ben Carson went with uh, Trump as, after Trump had, uh, you know, been disrespectful to him. And he says, well, there's two Trumps. The one in the blue tie is one Trump, and the one er, er, the one in the red tie is the real one, and the one in the blue tie is the double. Uh, and I thought it was interesting because the guy did get around a whole lot, you know, for a seventy-year-old. So, <laughs> did you happen to catch that clip? Or uh, you know, I've heard that Hillary's dead. <laughs> I, I <yeah. laughs> heard Hillary's dead. You know, she died with that brain that brain injury surgery, right? And they cloned her um, with Trump. I tend to, I, I definitely see the MPD in him. That's for sure. The multiple, multiple personality thing. Yeah. It's pretty obvious. I mean, who talks like that? Who speaks in a coherent sentence, saying something like, "And now we pass this order because it's bad. We don't like him. They're not coming. So it's good. It's great." And he, you know, so he'll, then he'll speak in a, in a coherent sentence, and it goes, "Great, love it." Like. It's, it sounds like two or three people in there. <laughs> oh. oh man! Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Mubal is asking about what kind of you know. What's your diet like? What do you What do you eat, John? Um, I'm not a vegan, um, but I certainly I think I go to that when I would say, I would say when you when I'm not feeling great or I need that energy, I would say going to a vegan meal or a raw meal. I highly recommend. I think it's uh, you know obviously you get more nutrients out of it and it's easier for the di digestion. It really cleans your system. Um, but uh, you know, my I would say I eat a you know I, I eat a normal you know I guess normal 
which is kind of a strange word, but um, you know, trying to be conscious of, of organic produce as much as possible. Um, but yeah, I'm not like overly, overly uh, extreme with with the health consciousness. Mainly, I do supplements, things like uh, for the immune system in particular. Um, I, I think I noticed on one of your interviews, and I forgot what it was, but you were slurping down some uh, rather thick, green-looking uh, smoothie at the point. And, and yeah, I do exactly. something like That's, that, too. I Yeah, have... certainly, 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 like, you know, um, you know, shakes and, uh, you know, a lot of okay, my fruit and, and um, some spirulina. I think, you know, supplement spirulina, um, acidophilus, uh, garlic, um, you know, thieves oil if you're feeling sick, oregano if you're feeling sick. I mean, think you know, obviously vitamin C. I mean, the main thing is getting your vitamins and your and your minerals and supplements so that you don't, you know, so you can protect your body. That's what I was telling people. It's like you don't want to get to the place where you're where you're sick and you're you know you need to resort to um, you know antibiotics or things like this. The point is to really build your immune system and preserve your organs and you know yeah. drink your drink your detox teas and all that kind of stuff, nettle tea, things like this, um, as much as possible. And ultimately, just work to alkalize. I think that's the main thing. Is when you we know when we acidify, it makes it easier for you know acidifying yeah sugars and salts. We make ourselves vulnerable to uh, viruses and bacteria to grow and fester. I want to make uh, this was up earlier when we were talking the pharma stuff, and it's an interesting you know we have some interesting wordsmiths in here, and so uh, Courage Sower came up with the uh, term uh, pharmacological uh, Stockholm syndrome. You know, for all the kids that are, you know, being drugged in the school system. And then it ties right into that report that uh, Rachel just did about this movie that she went to about how they get addicted to the pharma, pharma, you know, opioids. And then when they can't afford them anymore, they lose their job and then they're out buying the, the smack on the street. So, Yep, that's called, that movie's called Chasing the Dragon. It's on YouTube. It's definitely worth watching. Yeah. No, it sounds fascinating. Yeah. It no, I think this is awesome. We get Sean Stone on the line. We're asking what he eats. This is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that, this is the type of access we bring people at Shadow Citizen. Yeah. This is great. Um, now, I wanted to go back to um, your movie, the, A Century of War. That movie really hit me, especially we're still talking about this health thing. There was a fact in there. It said the average... American, middle-aged American, the United States now has a life expectancy of a middle-aged, not even middle-aged man, but a man in Pakistan. Whereas the mm. um, highest wealth earners in America, they have they have like unlimited life expectancy compared to the rest of the planet. Yeah, yeah. That was an incredible fact. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, because. You literally, I mean, you saw these studies coming out, and they were saying, um, basically, over what, the last decade or so, post-2000, you've actually seen the first time that, you know, the life expectancy of the the boomers, basically, or, you know, people in their, like, what, 45 to 65 range or something, mm -hmm. um, was dropping. Like, mm -hmm. their life expectancy was going down. And that was just, like, a tremendously stark realization for people that um, a lot of these people, you know, a lot of them were dying from alcoholism. Um, yeah. alcohol and drug abuse and uh, suicide right so it's looking at this 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 you know just to understand that again as I said before you have a shrinking of the middle class and we have not taken care of our people you know from the perspective of uh, middle America in particular this is like this is a lot of the rural sector the rural sector in particular was having this mm -hmm. issue farmers you know people that used to be small farmers you know who got who lost their their land, or they lost their uh, their work to big big uh, agriculture. Um, so yeah, there's an overall despair that I feel it set in into America. And uh, you know, how do we how do we deal with our despair? Well, then we lash out and we find new people to hate and uh, attack and say that they're uh, they're attacking us because we love nothing more in America than being the victim, which is one of the most startling <sighs> things. That American yeah, history. that's true. That's we true. Always, you know, we always have the right, and we lay claim to everything that we do. On you know, by God's divine order, you know, mission. We're here in America, but from day one, this was our land, and the Indians were, were attacking us. And then <laughs> you name it, everything from there was always, you know, we are the divine, you know, missionaries, and uh, everyone is attacking us mm -hmm. because they hate our 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 mission. Basically, like we were the new, you know, the new Zion. Basically, right? America was the new Zion. 
Well, we're going to run out of time, and uh, because we're plugging your film, I guess I would feel uh, like I didn't hold you to task if I didn't bring this up. But I'm going to first mention your 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 father's film, uh, JFK, and uh, you know that made it okay for people to question uh, conspiracies and that you know which the you know the CIA tried to make the word conspiracy theory you know you know associated with nutters, tinfoil hat wearing people. But one of the th reasons they think that JFK might have been assassinated was because he was going to repeal the uh, uh, the oil depreciation allowance. I pronounced that wrong. Sorry. Uh, but now. And so, yeah, big oil, we got the oil garkies, as uh, James, or James Corbett, you know, calls them. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the money, and you mentioned this agreement by, you know, Kissinger with the Saudis, and so the petrodollar. And uh, what I'm getting at is your, your movie into, I think, part three, you start plugging, uh, you know, nuclear energy. And we have, you know, this huge scar, uh, you know, the the Fukushima plant is still leaking. And so the problems with nuclear energy, even back in the 70s when I was a geologist, you know, was, what are we going to do with the waste? And now, you know, they, Trump wants to build a wall when we should be building up, you know, <laughs> uh, some way to enclose and encircle the Fukushima plant. But yeah, I, I, I think one of the things that's kind of uh, consistent in this uh, alternate movement is we call decentralize and repeal. Uh, and so if you're going to rely on another big source of energy like nuclear power rather than, well, you know, diesel, uh, design the diesel engine to run on vegetable oil. And we could be having hemp all over the place for enough hemp oil to replace uh, oil. So. I, I've got to ask you, you know, why did you go with with nuclear energy and uh, when there are so many alternatives out there? Absolutely, because the alternatives are not powerful enough to actually fuel an industrial economy. The thing is that everyone who advocates for, you know, the solar and wind farms are basically talking about, sure, if you're talking about powering your house and, you know, potentially your vehicle, you know, personal vehicle, you know, small things like of that order are smaller. I'm talking about if you, if you, you know, we want localization, but you need you still need um, central authorities if you want to create rail systems, for example. You know, rail systems that go thousands of miles that connect the continents, that could connect um, you know the U the U.S. with Mexico, for example. Or if you want any you know mass uh, transit, um, if you want a space program, it's you know nuclear is is the best starting point. Um, you mentioned. Uh, the documentary talks about fusion, which is obviously our long-term goal, and it's already seen a lot of spin-off effect from hot fusion exploration into plasma plasma physics, for example. Um, a lot of you know ability to research and understand you know uh, science of, of cancers, things like this. I mean, we've, we've gone a long way um, with spin-off, and then you talk about the Fukushima thing. Well, Fukushima was an outdated plant. I mean, that plant was so old; it was supposed to be, it should have been decommissioned by any sane person um it was left you know in, in, in basically in, in, in an outdated uh format the new plants can't have that kind of uh, meltdown and what we talk about promoting most in the documentaries was thor what's called thorium uh based fission processes because those can actually um, utilize that waste you're talking about a nuclear waste that's sitting there currently underground we talk about this in the documentary and you can actually use it as a fuel source so my whole point is you know let's stop being uh, you know fearful and panicky and start realizing that it's like comparing um, the Boeing 777 with a Wright Brothers airplane and saying well those planes are dangerous yeah but you keep evolving and advancing and evol you know your technologies and you find that you, you know that you come to new discoveries and new places of understanding and also you know again in the process of understanding nuclear we've understand we've come to understand the, the nature of atoms in a, in, a, in a revolutionary way to understand that energy is uh, mutable and tra transmutable with um, with uh, physical matter. So basically, we're tr we're looking ultimately to transform anything, and this is good for recycling purposes, right? To ultimately move towards um, recycling all of our, you know, you name it, plastic wastes, all these things that we're dumping in landfills. We should be converting a, a to their basic form, their basic particles as much as possible, um, but also uh, ultimately into a fuel source in itself. So the idea is, you know, I'm a I'm someone who's saying we need progress. We need to stop looking back and saying, well, 30 years ago, you know, nuclear was was terrifying. It's like none of the meltdowns were as bad as as people screamed they were, 
And in the long run, we could be much further if we had focused our energy from a central position on those techniques. And then, you know, on one hand, centralized energy for certain things that you need from a national, international perspective. And then absolutely promote local local energy production um, as much as possible. We also talk about cold fusion because that's a smaller, that's more of a smaller scale um, uh you know, production source. I'm going to jump in yeah. here because energy is kind yeah. of my gig. But, uh, yeah, th I, you know, yes, obsolete design for the Fukushima reactor, but it was a GE-built uh, reactor, and we've got like 14 of that very same design still running in the United States. Uh, they always uh, do these reactors next to large bodies of water. Uh, the re and, you know, up, up on the Iron Range here, you know, they – that because the population is so densely packed, they 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 have central heat plants. You know, each house doesn't have its own furnace; they have its own heat plant. So the the heat that's uh, being generated by the nuclear facilities, maybe it's not needed in like California and that. But uh, you know, why in Red Wing where they have a nuclear facility, why are they dumping the heat into the river when they could be pumping it back into the town? You know, so this is all profit motive by big. Uh, you know, big. Once again, you know, global corporations is, you know, part of this shadow system that is promoting this big energy. So how do we get off it? And uh, Jared is screaming in the room, hydrogen, hydrogen. And I see uh, 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 Nikola Motors now has a tractor that is a uh, that runs on hydrogen. You know, it's a, like a Mack truck or a Freightliner or whatever. Uh, a, a big tractor for pulling commercial trailers that runs and it's a uh, it's hydrogen that's uh, fuel cells that uh, run electric motors and they got a huge range on them which is astonishing that's cool to me. that's cool I do have a question yeah. for Sean I, I, Sean you had said you had said yeah you had said something that um, for Fukushima the when you said all of the other um, reactors that melted down they weren't as bad as the media portrayed them to be. Where would people get information in order to make a, a real assessment of the situation? Because if we're being fed things to keep us alarmed, and it will probably took well, well, no, somebody's three, stock price. Well, um, no, the Three we, Mile Island thing was was a real scare tactic because they right. released China, the China syndrome, wasn't it, at the same mm -hmm. time? And right. so we really thought some people had died at, at Three Mile Island, um, which was not true. Um, mm -hmm. It was, you know, it was an alert. It was, you know. It, it, it could have been bad. It really, you know, it wasn't. So we never had a tremendous meltdown in America. Um, Chernobyl, the studies show it. Really, you know, it was not nearly as bad as what people had imagined. Um, it mm -hmm. was. It was obviously not. A, you know, it was a terrible thing, and it was. You know, again, it was. It, you know, it's a nature of a the Soviet system, um, and, uh, and again, an outmodeled, an outmodeled, outdated plant itself. Uh, but look at how people die from coal mining over the years, or you know any number of these things. Oil has just devastated how many you know people uh, from the various spills and 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 the ecosystems. Right. I mean, so it's like it's all comparable. My point is like we overreact to things. It's you know, right. You know, so one where would people where would people work, look? The chemical plants in Bhopal, you know, kills what fifty thousand Indians was right, it? Or, right, right, right. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Was yeah. Yeah. So let's be honest. Like let's just be realistic about the nature of. The world we're in, and I'm someone who's very much progress, and you know, uh, I'm problem solving. I'm saying, look, let's move forward. Let's try to figure out how to solve a problem rather than putting, you know, constantly saying, well, here's the problem, and we can't solve it. No, everything can be solved if mm -hmm. you put your mind to it. Right. No, I agree with you that people, even if there's the, all the oils run dry, and even if the water is completely irradiated. Humans will figure out how to make it better for themselves because that's what humans yeah. do. They want okay. things better for themselves, so they invent something. Um, exactly, exactly, and that's the whole thing is that we can, you know, we can use desalination. And again, that's why I say nuclear because desalination plants are very energy intensive. But that's going to be an important step forward, for, you know, for dealing with water shortages that are that are coming. You talk about the Rockefellers investing in pharmaceuticals; they are investing in water, and that's what they want to do in the next water wars because they want people to think that water is scarce. And that's not true. I mean, water is the most abundant thing on the planet if you, you know, work to either get it, irrigate it, or um, desalinate it. But you can't yes. just sit there and expect a bottle of water to come to you. 
Well, that was one of my things too. For since I was in high school in the '70s, is why aren't why don't we have floating platforms that turn solar energy into hydrogen and oxygen that can you know? Because then when, once it's burned, it you you know all you have is you know is water is the byproduct. So uh, uh, you know that would I mean it's desalinating because it's being turned into hydrogen and oxygen, and then once it's cons- you know, turned back to, to energy it, it's honestly rob every my son he's how old is he? he's 11 he's gonna be 12 he just said when he gets older he's gonna invent a car that takes all this yucky water that everybody's complaining about and make cars that run off of it so that mm. the cars release regular water right and i was like that's a really but here's just a little kid thinking about it. like people just have to open their minds to think like well, a little kid that's the hydrogen fuel cell concept. But exactly, that's the whole point. Children have this sense of wonder. They have the sense of curiosity. They have the sense of, we can do this. And yes. unfortunately, people who are, you know, they tend to grow up and they say, oh, you have to conform to the system and make money and the corporations have taken over and it's all about profit. It's like, yeah, but you're killing us. <laughs> you're killing yeah. yourself. Okay, yeah, we're, we, got, about- we got four minutes left. So, Rachel. You know, <laughs> oh, okay. Well, Sean, it has been our pleasure to have you with us. Um, there is one thing I wanted to ask you. Where can people, to give us the rundown of how people can get to you and you, the things that you've created. Sure, absolutely. So uh, you mentioned that I do a show on RT called Watching the Hawks. Uh, people mm-hmm. can watch that on RT, internet, you know, which is an international channel. They can find um, Watching the Hawks shows on RT.com. Uh, Century of War is available there. They want to watch the film, which they and, should. Uh, I think so. I think they should. Mm-hmm. Everyone should check it out. It would be. A, I think it would definitely help promote peace in the world if people watched it to understand. Wait a minute, we've got the wrong orientation going here. We need to be focusing on healing and helping each other, and not fighting for scarce resources. No, resources are infinite. Just the question of the human mind and how we deploy our energies. So, um, Century of War was on RT.com. Um, Buzzsaw, as you mentioned, is on Gaia.com, which is a great channel I, I recommend people subscribe to it it's basically what 100 bucks a year but it's well worth it they have a huge collection of documentaries and interview programs like mine really informative and conscious you know oriented towards expanding consciousness and awareness um, and then I would say uh, what else Facebook people can find me on Facebook Sean Stone is my my profile page and mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. here sorry. I am I'm going to Facebook right now I'm gonna click on it <laughs> always awesome. happy to hear yeah. messages you know people can yeah. send me messages or questions and things like this all right well, and thank you one, so one, much. one last question too you know because i i air kevin barrett's and he's a convert to islam too would you like to make any comments on that since there seems that seems to be the next war they're trying to push is the the fight against islam do you want to mention anything about that well, it's not the next war, it's the last war. <laughs> well, that will be the last yeah. war, yeah. I mean, it's such it's such a complicated question. I mean, again... We don't have time for it. When I have an understanding of Islam. It's, um, you know, it's a, it's a personal conception of, of spirituality. I, I've always said I'm, I believe Islam is a continuation of Judeo-Christianity. I don't see them as being ideologically, you know, uh, antagonistic to each other. They're, you know, Islam is predicated in, in the uh, Jewish traditions, it's predicated in Jesus as a messenger and prophet of the one creator. Um, you know, all these religions have been used historically for for, for conquest, for terror, for um, indoctrination and, and control. Um, you know, if anyone, Christian, tells you there's no Christian terrorists or that Islam is trying to conquer the world, you say, well, yeah, but Christians already did that. Because no one would be a Christian now if it hadn't been for the sword. There'd be no Christians here in the Americas if it hadn't been for the sword. There'd be no Christians in Europe if it hadn't been for the Roman sword. There's no, you know, so it's a, it's a nonsense to try to categorize Islam as some kind of violent aberration separate from uh, Israel, you know, Israel and, and uh, Hebrew conquests and uh, proclamations of being the chosen people, Christian proclamations of being the chosen people. Islam, I think, can resolve the three if we recognize that we are all, you know, children of the same creator, and if however you want to practice, that's up to you personally. I, I believe in spirituality, not dogma, and we have to embrace each other as brothers in faith and sisters in faith from one creator. And then that does expand to uh, Hinduism as well, but that's a bigger conversation. Yeah, right Hinduism. on. That was beautiful, Sean. That was beautiful. <laughs> we do have to get out of here, and we thank you so much for being with her. Um, I'm going to close the show with a song by 
Kelt Islam, which is a friend of mine on uh, Facebook, and he's wrote his uh, song called Silk Road, which I thought went very well with what we just talked about today. And thank you so much for everything, Sean. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you.